Hey everybody, welcome. We're really great to have you. Welcome to uh, Friday night, the first night of uh, our weekend with Ravi Zacharias. Uh, this is going to be, I wanted this to be kind of an informal night, uh, but I'm really, really glad you're here. I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. Let me tell you first why we have chosen or, or asked uh, Ravi Zacharias and his ministry to be a, a Micah 6-8 partner. For those of you who don't know, our church does something called Micah 6-8 where uh, we figured out that uh, we could have more of an impact on the world if we learned how to do 52 weeks of ministry on 48 weeks of income and then had four weekends a year that we could just give away to different ministries. Uh, and because you guys are the way that you are and uh, your generosity it kind of triggered even a deeper generosity inside of you uh, that uh, I don't know if any of us knew existed. And it's been a wonderful, wonderful thing. And uh, Micah 6, 8 is a verse that says, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Uh, so we find uh, ministries that uh, have to do with justice and mercy. And then we uh, will highlight or spotlight those ministries, and, uh, and then all the giving for that weekend will go to those ministries. And that's what we've been doing. Now, Robbie, uh, RZIM is different than what we usually do. There are two ways to, uh, to have justice and, uh, justice and mercy uh, impact on the world. One is from the bottom up and the other is from the top down. Bottom up means that every culture chews up certain people and spits them out the bottom. Uh, orphans, widows, trafficked, uh, slavery, all those kind of things. And Christians have always been great at uh, catching people who are spit out. And we have from the time from the very first century, right? So we have uh, coupled, partnered with a lot of ministries that work on the bottom up. But the other way to impact uh, this, this, the world for justice and mercy is to have an impact on the decision makers who actually can make decisions that change the fabric of a culture and make the whole culture more just, more merciful. Uh, there's probably no ministry that I know that does a better job or has more access uh, and wild access uh, to decision makers than Ravi Zacharias and his ministry. I need to, you know too that uh, it's RZIM, Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, and it's not just Ravi. He's got a whole bullpen of people like Nabil Qureshi, who was here three weeks ago. And uh, those of you who saw Nabil, you understand uh, what a, a, an amazing uh, group of people that Ravi has assembled over uh, the last 20 years, 30 years. How long? 20 years? 30 years? 30. All right. So what I've asked uh, Ravi to do uh, tonight is to just share with us some of what has uh, happened with RZIM over the years, uh, what the access that he's had in different places around the world uh, that really uh, no one else has access to. So um, I've asked him to do that for about 30 minutes, and then he's gonna, we're going to introduce uh, a man named Hayden Coe. Hayden Ko came to Christ through Ravi in the Philippines. If you remember back a year and four months ago when Tom Randall was arrested uh, and thrown in a, in a jail cell in the middle of Manila, uh, Hayden Ko was the one that went to see him. We're going to have Hayden give us his testimony. And then after Hayden gives his testimony, then I'm going to get back up with Tom Randall and Hayden and have them share kind of what happened uh, there in the Philippines, and how God orchestrated all that. All right? So uh, let me uh, go ahead and pray, and then we'll have Ravi come up. All right? Uh, Father in heaven, uh, thank you for uh, this night. Thanks for bringing everybody here that's here. Thanks for uh, the privilege of uh, hosting Ravi and how you've used him uh, all around the world, and how you're still using him. Uh, Lord, thanks for bringing us together. I pray that uh, this night, will be a night that will encourage people, but more than anything, will we'll glorify you and uh, draw us closer to you. Uh, so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So help me uh, welcome Ravi Zacharias. Well, judging on what's coming after me, I'd rather sit down and let it come already. Then you can enjoy the evening to have Hayden Coe and Tom after that tell you their story. That's just an amazing orchestration that only God could have done 
And uh, when you hear that, you will know this was his doing. No human being could ever have conjured up this sequence of events and this uh, connection of people to deal with an emergent situation when Tom was in the Philippines. So uh, that'll be after I finish sharing with you a little bit of the story of our ZIM. I think it'll be probably unfair to just jump in to the organizational side. I have to tell you a little bit about my own life and how it came to be that God, in his mercy, reached out to this young man in uh, Delhi, India. In fact, while we were flying in here this afternoon, uh, my wife sitting next to me, and by the way, I'm always delighted to have my wife with me. She is almost never with me. I can't compete with the grandchildren anymore. She is at home. Somebody once said to Winston Churchill, have I ever told you about my grandchildren? He said, no, and I want you to know how much I appreciate it. So I won't tell you, I won't tell you much about that, but Margie is with me this weekend, and it's a delight for me to have her here. But as we were flying in, I showed her a letter that I received just before we boarded from my sister in Toronto. She's married to uh, Sundar Krishnan, who's a well-known expositor. Sundar is now my brother-in-law. We grew up from the time we were six years old. When I came to know Christ, Sundar was preparing <clears throat> for a course in nuclear physics, became a nuclear physicist, went on to Toronto, Canada, became their top safety expert there, and then God tapped his shoulder to go into the ministry. And uh, that's where he is now, and he's been in the ministry now for 35 years. We are almost the identical age. He's six months older than I am. I never let him forget that. And <clears throat> but she wrote to me, and she said, I'm in Arizona vacationing with Sundar, and we were in Lima before that. And she went on to meeting people who'd been touched by this ministry, and she said, I just want to say something to you, Ravi. She said, Dad always thought you would end up in jail <laughs> in your life. That's her exact words. <clears throat> Dad always thought you would end up in jail. And I remember him telling Mom that, that I was really a rotter, had no purpose in life, and that I was, I was going to end up in jail. She said, today all I can say is, God had plans far different to what any one of us had ever envisioned for you. And you know, when your own sister writes a long, protracted letter of affirmation and appreciation, you know how the Grand Weaver has worked in your own life. I used to listen to a lot to English music when I was supposed to be studying. I had my physics textbook by an Indian author by the name of G.L. Datta. Anybody who studied science in India knows the name of G.L. Datta. The only problem was if you'd opened my book, it would always open on the same page because I never turned it. I would just sit there and I'd be daydreaming. We used to sit around the dining table, the five of us kids, assigned to study for two hours. I'd be look, staring at G.L. Datta, but with the low tones of music in the background. And it used to be called the voice of Radio Salon, Choice of the People. Now it's Sri Lanka. And one day I remember listening to this song. I used to do a lot of memory work right from the time I was young. So I started listening to this song every day as it would come 6.30 p.m. And I would start memorizing it. This is the way it went. Ed Ames narrating it. That dates me. But in the background of that song was an Eastern chant while Ames would narrate it in these words. From the canyons of the mind, we wander on and stumble blind. Way through the often tangled maze of starless nights and sunless days, hoping for some kind of clue, a road to lead us to the truth. But who will answer? As side by side two people stand together vowing hand in hand that love's embedded in their hearts, but soon an empty feeling starts to overwhelm their hollow lives. And if they ask the hows and whys, who will answer? As far upon a distant ledge, a young man's, uh, far upon a distant hill, a young man's lying very still, his arms will never hold his child because a bullet running wild has struck him down and now he cries, my God, oh why, oh why, and who will answer? As high upon a lonely ledge, a figure teeters near the edge while jeering crowds collect below to egg him on with, go man, go, and none will ask what led him to his private day of doom and who, who will answer? As neat the spreading mushroom tree, the world revolves with apathy while overhead are off specks drones out drowned out by discotheques, and if the secret button is pressed because one man has been our guest, who will answer? Is our hope in walnut shells, worn round the neck with temple bells, or deep within some cloistered walls where hooded figures pray in shawls, 
or high upon some dusty shelves or in the stars or in ourselves, who will answer? And the chorus went this way. If the soul is darkened by a fear it cannot name, if the mind is baffled when the rules don't fit the game, who will answer? Who will answer? Who will answer? There were two things that struck me about that song. Number one, it was being narrated by an American. And I always thought growing up in India, if I could ever end up in America, I'd be okay. I'd find some prosperous lifestyle. Everything would be wonderful. I'd have all the income I needed. I wouldn't have, be plagued by questions anymore. That was the first thing. But the second thing was, it was not what would logically come into your mind, what is the answer, but it was who will answer. And that's what kept digging deep into my own soul, that everybody is asking the same questions, but this man is asking it differently, who will be the answer? And I was driven to ask question after question after question. My mother looked at me one day totally frustrated and said, where do you come up with all these questions? I said, I don't know. They come, in, come up from within me. I have these questions. She was a simple woman. Yes, she was educated, but she was a very simple-minded person. My father and mother had an arranged marriage. He came from a rather sophisticated family. She came from a simple background, very different story, and it was a struggle for all those years. My mother could have walked out of that family with all the struggle and pain that was being inflicted upon her, and I mean that, pain that was inflicted on her, emotional and physical. But she would look at us kids and wonder what would ever happen to us, and of all of the five, she had a special fear that I would be destroyed if she were not around there to protect me from my own dad. That's the way it was. But then at the age of 17, I was on a bed of suicide when a Bible was brought to me. I'd never cracked open a Bible in my life before that. And as that Bible was given to me, and I was, I couldn't hold the Bible because my body was dehydrated. I had poisoned my system. And the moisture had gone with just uh, all the uh, nausea that it had induced. It spilled out all the moisture out of my body. And it was the servant in the house had rushed me to the hospital and they put me in a, on IVs. I would not have made it. But I couldn't lift my arm up. I couldn't put my hands together. And so it was my mother who had, was given the Bible. And she was told what chapter to read. And the man was not allowed to stay. He left. And uh, he gave her John chapter 14. Jesus is talking to Thomas, who was the one who'd really gone to India to preach the gospel in the southern tip of India of Kerala. And the first seven of his converts were from, were from the highest caste of the Hindu priesthood called the Nambudris. My ancestors were all Nambudris. They came from the highest caste of the Hindu priesthood. And here I'm now listening to Jesus talking to Thomas. I couldn't put it all together then. I knew nothing of this then. All I knew is that he's talking to this man to whom he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. And then as it goes on in chapter, verse 19 of chapter 14, he says this, because I live, you shall live also. That was the who I'd been looking for. That was the who I'd been looking for. Because I live you also shall live. And I just pray, prayed a simple prayer. I said, Jesus, if you are who you are claiming to be, the author of life, the giver of life, take me out of this hospital room. I will leave no stone unturned in my pursuit of truth. I will follow you with my whole heart. That was when I was 17 years old. I celebrated my 69th birthday two weeks ago, 52 years ago. That transformation took place. I have never looked back except look back with amazement and a day never goes, like today, you know, my sister writing to me and just saying, I can't believe all that God has done and accomplished in your life and so forth. There are questions. People have questions. People suffer from emptiness, no meaning. They want something to hold on to that tells them life can be put together, that there are not just answers, there is a who to whom you can be related. And so when I came to Canada and was going into business, long story, I won't belabor all of that. I was going into the hotel and catering the hospitality industry. 
I saw what was going on in those hotel rooms night after night. I was only 20 years old at that time, and I said, there are more problems here than solutions. People are coming here barren and empty, and once that midnight hour struck, a mania seems to break out in these places. All kinds of things happen. I said, I don't want to be hanging around this the rest of my life. I turned in my resignation, went into theological training, and graduated and pursued several studies, both at Trinity and Deerfield and then at Cambridge University and so on. All that happened in my heart, God had prepared for a purpose. And in 1983, when I was a professor in Nyack, New York, for the denomination, that's where I first met your pastor, by the way, Pastor Joe, we've known each other for many, many years. I was with the Christian Mission Alliance. I still am licensed and ordained by them. I've been with them now for 42 years of ordained ministry. I'm licensed with them. But as I was a professor there, I said, this is really not my calling. I'm doing it to honor my leaders. I'm not an academic. I'm an evangelist. I'm an apologist. And I, Billy Graham had asked me to come and speak for him in, at Amsterdam 83. And here, speaking to the world's leading 4,000 evangelists, I'd sat down afterwards. Dr. Graham had been so kind in his comments about that message. I didn't even know until that point he knew I existed. Really. And uh, as he chatted with me afterwards and before, I said, you know, I've noticed something out here. And while flying back with my wife, Margie, we'd gone from Amsterdam to India, saw the poverty there amongst the clergy and lack of education. I put the two together and I said to her, almost every evangelist speaking to the evangelist was basically talking about evangelism to the unhappy pagan. I said, and that's wonderful, but nobody's telling us how to reach the happy pagan. And there's a lot of happy pagans around. Those who are not even asking the questions. I said, if your life is falling apart, yeah, you need a doctor. But if you think you're well, but you don't realize that inside of you is something that is not immediate, but is just as fatal. How do you reach that kind of person? So I told her I was going to go back and resign my job. And you know, we had three young children. I was the chairman of the department. You had a salary coming in. You had all the security. What are you going to do with three young kids and you're going out on a step of faith to start a new ministry? So I said to her, don't tell your mom and dad about this, please. <laughs> no, because he gave me quite the interview before I married her. And I was a rigorous chemical engineer. It's about the only thing he didn't ask me at that time was the length of my trousers. He'd asked everything else from my bank account, what I plan to earn, how I plan to support her and all of that because he expected it to be my duty. I said, please don't tell your mom and dad about this. As a matter of fact, don't tell anybody about it. Let's just pray. If we had $50,000 from somewhere, we'll take this as the Lord's prompting to move ahead. I want to start a Christian apologetics ministry and build a team that will defend the faith in the midst of audiences comprised of the happy pagans in the academic arena, in the intellectual arena, in the business arena, and in the arts. Four of those arenas, and of course within churches and so on. So she said, boy, that's a lot of money. I said, yep, we never received anything like that. I think the big, I forget even what the biggest amount I'd ever received as a young student. And so we're praying about this. And then I was invited to speak to about 300 businessmen and women not far from here in a place called Sawmill Creek, Ohio. Okay. So I got off the plane. I didn't even know where Sawmill Creek was. We were driven out there, landed at Cleveland. I spoke to these business people. And uh, Gordon McDonald was the other speaker. I'd spoken five times. And at the end of it, I closed my Bible and I said, I want you all to do me a favor. When you're driving back to the airport or wherever you are in Ohio, will some person in each car please, please pray for me and my wife? I can't tell you what it is about. We're seeking God's wisdom. That's all I want to tell you. Ask God to give us his wisdom. Margie and I went back to our room, picked up our suitcases. We're walking out. There's a man standing by the glass doors. He said... I want you to know, I went back to my room and I got on my knees and prayed for you. And before I got off my knees, praying for wisdom for you, I said, God, is there anything you want me to do to help this young couple? And he said, God has given it, laid on my heart to give you a check for $50,000. It was 1983, November of 1983. It was a lot of money then, it's a lot of money now. 
I just looked at him in a state of shock. I was so glad my wife was next to me because if I'd gone back and told her the story, she'd have said, are you sure this man is all right? What kind of person have you met like this? Totally out of the blue. So I looked at him and I said, your name is sir? He said, my name is D.D. Davis. I'm from Youngstown, Ohio. He said, I've loved what you've done this weekend. I want to take care of you. I said, Mr. Davis, you don't know me, sir. I don't know you. I find it difficult to take so much money from a total stranger. If you will tell me where you live, I will fly in and see you sometime in the next couple of months. And after I tell you what's on my heart, if you still feel so inclined, we can talk further then. He said, no, no, no. You're, you're, you're a very busy man, I know. And he said, uh, I have a plane. I'll fly in and see you. Tell me where you live. And a few days later, he landed in White Plains, New York. We were in Ny Nyack across the Tappan Zee. We sat in the Hilton with him and his wife. And as I poured out the heart for a ministry in Christian apologetics that will reach the thinker, reach the skeptic, reach the happy pagan, prepare our young men and women in our churches and adults in our churches to be able to give a reason for the hope that is within them and to be able to give a meaningful answer to the questions that are asked of them. That's what I really want to do. And you know, the tears were running down his face. Do you know what he said to me? He said, Ravi, I have not even finished high school, he said. He said, I ran away from home when I was 18. He said, but I know how to make money. He said, I've made more money in my life than I'll ever be able to spend. You do what God's called you to do. I will take care of you. This will only be the beginning. Bring some friends uh, together and we can talk and get this organization underway. And I just got terrified about all of this. I said, wow. I went back home. I couldn't pick up my cup of coffee. I said, is this for real? I said, what do you want from me? What will this mean for me? in my relationship to you. He said, nothing much, just one thing. He said, your integrity. He said, you promise me your integrity and let your yea be yea and your nay be nay and I'll take care of you. He honored that trust for 20 years when he passed away 10 years ago. It was not just that we'd lost such a generous giver, which he was, I felt I'd lost a kind of a father figure in him because he was such a good man. And when he was buried in Youngstown, his daughters, his two daughters asked if I would come and speak at the funeral. And he was also a military veteran. And so they wrapped the, the casket in a flag. And when the funeral was over, they took that flag off, folded it. And the daughters said, we want you to have this. You are the son my father never had and you were the one he so implicitly trusted. So the ministry was born here. For years and years, Ohio was really our number one state in support because of Didi and several others from this area. When this ministry began and got underway, my goal was to have a team get on the air, do some writing, and get the ministry on every major continent. I didn't know how we were gonna do this. I want you to know something. I am not a planner. I am not a process person. There's only two things I really do. I speak and write, and sometimes I'm not sure I'm doing that well enough either. That's all I do. I speak and write. I cannot endure board meetings. I do not like long, drawn-out administrative stuff. If anybody would do that for me, I think my idea of hell at that time was to become an administrator. You know, yeah, if you had to administer everything, I, I just had no attraction to that. I had no such things for figures and planning and scheming and all. I prepare a talk. I could write a book. That's all I was trying to do. God started to work. He started to work in ways that made it absolutely sure in my mind this had nothing to do with me. This had everything to do with this calling. You see, just before I left India, I had applied for the Indian Air Force to become a pilot. India was at war with Pakistan. It was just another job. I said, I've failed at everything else. Let me try GD pilots. They had 300 people interviewed. They were going to select 10. I came in at number three. So I phoned home and said, done it. All the exams are over, physical endurance. I used to be quite the athlete in those days. I used to run great distances every day. I leaped over walls and this and that, and I was selected. So I phoned, phoned home and said, done. I'm going to be going to the National Defense Academy. I'm going to be in the Indian Air Force. 
One more interview left. I went for the interview, and a big Churchillian-looking, jowly individual, a wing commander, looked at me after the interview, and he said, Beta, that's in Hindi, it means son. He said, Beta, you're a nice young man. I thought something horrible is about to happen. <laughs> he said, I know you're placed number three. He said, but I am going to reject you. I hated that word. I said, why? He said, this job is about killing. And psychologically, you are not equipped to kill. You know, for just a moment, I wondered if I could prove him wrong right then and there, you know. <laughs> but one look at him, and uh, a fool I wasn't. His size, he would have had me for a meal that night, you know. I walked out of there in a daze. I said, what on earth? I had no courage to phone my parents. When I arrived back by train, my parents had brought all their friends along with garlands and sweets at the railway station to congratulate me. I said, my goodness, you talk about a humiliation out here. I didn't have the heart to tell them. Had I been accepted in the Indian Air Force, I'd have been a minimum commitment for about 20 years. There'd been no thought of where God had in mind for me. He blocked my path in order to open the door that he wanted to open for me. The ministry of RZIM began some years after I moved, as I told you the story, how it did. Ten years ago, I was in Oxford having breakfast with Alistair McGrath and Michael Ramsden, my colleague. And I said to them, you know, we're talking about three initiatives out here that I'm thinking about. One of them was to have a place where we could train academics philosophically in high-level education at Oxford. Michael Ramsden had been talking about it. Alistair McGrath gave us the possibility. So we were going to open the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics. The second initiative we wanted to have was Wellspring International, a charitable arm of this ministry that would reach out to the hurting of the world, especially women and children at risk. I'd, in all of my travels, I'd seen so many horrific things happening in the prostitution industry. I said, somebody has to be involved in rescuing this. So we started Wellspring International. At that time, my daughter Naomi was working in the White House under President Bush, and they were offering her position under John Ashcroft at the Justice Department. I flew her in from there to tell her, I know your heart, I know your passion, because right out of graduation from Wheaton, you went to the Dominican to work with orphans. I said, would you consider leading this work of rescuing women and children and from the sex trafficking industry in Wellspring International? She went back, prayed about it. She said, Dad, this is on my heart all along. She anchored that. Then I, the third vision was to reach the Islamic world, but to do it in a way where we had Westerners prepared to understand the language and the nature of the Quran and understand Islamic doctrine thoroughly to be able to defend their own culture and their own teaching so that a supervening worldview that was contrary to the worldview that helped found this nation would not be able to overwhelm this culture. Pluralism is a good thing, but the absolute truth and the nature on which this nation was founded, only the truths of the Judeo-Christian worldview could have founded a nation like this. No other worldview could have. You take the Declaration of Independence. Pantheism, Islam would never have framed a statement that we believe these truths to be self-evident, that we are all created equal, endowed by our creator with inalienable rights for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Hinduism would never have said that. Buddhism would never have said that. Pantheism would never have made a statement that we are all created equal. The karmic system is stratified. And given freedom by our, by our creator, Islam would never make a statement like that. Islam is a heteronymous culture that dictates for the masses. So I said we need to protect the values and so we had the third one called SWOD, Scholars with a Dream, because many Muslims were coming to Christ through dreams and visions and so on. But we needed the scholarly side of it. Wellspring International, the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics, SWOD, Scholars with a Dream, to prepare 100 scholars with a doctoral level degree in Islamics. We are well on our way to, be, to accomplishing that. Those three landmarks came 10 years ago. Today, when you look at the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics, to which your pastor has been, it's turning out some of the finest Christian apologists all over the world. 
you listen to an Amy or Ewing, or you listen to a Michael Ramsden, or you listen to a John Lennox, uh, or you listen to Michelle Tepper and uh, Christian Hofreiter. We've now placed apologists. We have we're a team of about 40 plus apologists placed in 11 different countries, in countries like Spain, in countries like South Africa, in countries like Australia, India, China, uh, uh, in the United Kingdom, in Canada. We've got a whole slew of well-trained apologists. And I just want to give you a couple of illustrations and then I'll close. How did God open the door for all of us? When I was invited to speak at the United Nations, the second time I was speaking there, they tell you about 15 to 17 minutes and you can't go overtly with the gospel. You've got to respect the plurality of those around you. So you speak for about 12, 13 minutes, last five minutes you bring the gospel in. At the end of it, they were all lined up. And one of them was from a, from a former Soviet country. I won't be specific. They were lined up there to shake hands with me. And this man looked at me and he said, I'm the United States. I'm the ambassador to the United Nations from such and such a country. He says, Mr. Zacharias, I hate my job. I don't want to come here. I didn't want to come here. I come from an atheistic country. And every day I kept wondering why I'm here, why I'm here. Today my question was answered. I came here so that I could find God. Will you please pray with me? And I had the privilege of praying with him, seeing him come to Jesus Christ. Just two weeks ago, I was in Jakarta, Indonesia, at a wedding. It's a Chinese tycoon, one of the leading industrialists there. There were 10,000 people at the wedding. And I was called at 5.30 in the morning saying there, were an ortho, there was an orthodox man following a major guru in India. And this man is from Australia, but he's of Indian stock. He's been wanting to meet you to ask questions. I said, you know, it's 5.30 in the morning. I've got a part to play here and so on. He said, please, this guy wants to see you. He says, come all the way, he wants to see you. A close friend of the man whose, host, whose son was getting married. I said, can we do it at 3.30 in the afternoon? He said, okay. So this man comes up to our room at 3.30 in the afternoon. It was no more than 30 minutes later, the tears are running down his face, and this high-placed businessman is bending his head, giving his life to Jesus Christ. When I walked out of that hotel that evening, we were about to board the car, get into the car to go for the reception. His wife came to me and said, my husband was a fanatic with the guru that he used to follow. I couldn't believe what he said to me has just happened this afternoon. We see this all over the place. Our radio program is on 2,000 stations. The letters that we get, 10 days ago, or two weeks ago, when we were in Indonesia, my wife went to Papua New Guinea. She's always wanted to go into the interior there. Margie Hale's from Toronto, and wanted to be a missionary to Papua someday, and I fouled up all those plans for her when we met. So she said she wanted to go to Papua, and they arranged for a flight to take her into the interior, five hours away from Jakarta. And there she was around a table with some missionaries and saw some of the local residents there. And then the father of the missionary was 100 years old. He said, I'm visiting my son and I want you to know every day I listen to Let My People Think. I listen to this radio program, the voice of your husband and your speakers. I know them well. That same day, I received a letter from a woman who said she was in a doctor's waiting room listening to one of our podcasts, and a six-year-old girl came over and said, I think you're listening to Ravi Zacharias. Six years old. She said, how do you know this guy? She says, he sa uh, she says my father makes me listen to him every day, you know. <laughs> from 100 years to six years old. If I could tell you the lives that are transformed and how they are changed, you would be quite overwhelmed. I want to close with this little story and then link up to Hayden. I wasn't watching the clock. I'm, I'm sure my time's up. So let me at least tell you this. It was a uh, little over two years ago, I was speaking in Bahrain. I was invited by the government leadership to speak on Is Peace Possible? I said, I'd like to qualify that with God, yes. Will you let me speak on that? So they are there, quite a fascinating audience. A young boy came up to me and he said, Mr. Zacharias, can I have your email ID? I said, why do you want that? He said, I have some questions. I thought, oh, questions, you know. I said, okay. I said, don't give it to anybody. Questions, 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 you know. So next day I get this. Dear sir, this is Abraham from Bahrain. We just met last night. 
I honestly want to tell you that your speech was absolutely awesome. I've been an admirer of your ministry since the time I first heard you speak at Bahrain in 2003. I was only five years old then. But now I'm 14 and have finished reading all your books like The Real Face of Atheism, The Lotus and the Cross, Jesus Among Other Gods, Sense and Sensuality, The End of Reason, Why I'm Not an Atheist, The Grand Weaver, Walking from East to West, etc. They made a great impact on my life and my way of thinking. I really wanted to get your email ID and I'd sent a mail email to the RZIM office requesting for it, but I've not received a reply for more than a year. Thank you for giving me your ID yesterday. I've also heard many of your tapes, like Barriers to Belief, Absolute Truth in Relative Terms, A Fish Out of Water, A Life That Lost Its Focus, What Happened After God's Funeral, which is my favorite, The Haunting Specter of Guilt, Though the Fig Tree Does Not Bud, The Lostness of Man, Who Are You God, etc., etc. You know, sir, you may feel all this is pretty hard for a 14-year-old to digest. But honestly, I love those messages. I saw the DVD of you speaking at the University of Michigan in the Q&A session. Sir, thank you so much for the wonderful impact you've made on my life. I will always remember to pray for you and your ministry. May God bless you abundantly and give you a long, long life. I remain yours faithfully, Abraham Matthew, Bahrain. 14. I flew to Bahrain a few months after that. Didn't tell him I was coming. Called him. First called his father. Found out he was a medical practitioner at the local hospital. Went and had dinner with them that night. He'd lost his mother when he was only seven years old, this little boy had. He's a genius. I told the dad, I'm going to keep an eye on your son. God's got his hand upon him. Ladies and gentlemen, our young people are desperately looking for light along their path. Sexually, they indulge till they wipe themselves out. They have nothing fanciful to look forward to anymore. They have spent themselves and they've come away empty-handed. All of the gizmos and all of the stuff we've given to them, they have actually depersonalized the real individual and personalized subjectivity and they could be talking to total strangers and think they are actually having a meaningful conversation. Our youth are at dire straits on a lonely path to emptiness. I am committed more than ever. And so one of the visions God has given to me to follow this, a year ago I began to think of setting up a center for Christian apologetics in Atlanta, Georgia. We are calling it IACT, the Institute of Apologetics and Contemporary Thought. We're in the process of negotiating the purchase of a large building and a few buildings there to bring in youth from all over the world, prepare them and train them to help our churches, help our pastors, have symposiums, bring in the best scholars, have scholars in residence to be able to prepare the church to, to face a, a kind of a strident skepticism. You cannot set a tepid Christianity besides a scorching paganism. You cannot set a tepid Christianity besides a scorching paganism. And we have to have that heart warmed and the truth so ably defended. Maybe we'll get a chance on Sunday night to answer some questions on that. And now to my closing thought. Uh, it was a year ago in June, I was in Manila in the Philippines, and I'd finished speaking, I'd spoken to a large, several thousand in attendance. I was tired out. And a gentleman had asked me to go for dinner. So I said, all right. I'd already told him I'll be tired by the end of the day. No speaking, just dinner, right? because I found out there's no free meal when you're in the ministry. <laughs> it's like doctors going to dinner. They never have a dinner without getting consultations by whoever is sitting next to them. And so I said, okay, if you just want to take me out for dinner. So we're driving and driving, and I thought, something is not right here. Matt was my traveling associate at that time. I said, you know, I have a feeling I'm going to speak here, because why is he taking us so far? So I arrived, and there's about 45 business people sitting around their tables and a lectern. I said, this is no dinner, they're going to eat, and I'm going to talk. <laughs> sure enough, he introduces me. I have a friend here, and today's my birthday, and this is my birthday gift to you. So his birthday gift to them was me. <laughs> so I start speaking, I said, this is no fun, you know. Well, I did. He wanted, to speak on, wanted me to speak on a search for meaning. And then I, he said, now that we've made this man suffered so much, let's inflict a little more suffering. 
why don't you answer some questions? Oh, I said, okay. So I stood up, and this guy here, Hayden Co., comes up to the front of the microphone, and he puts his arms out like this. He's got a big span. And he says to me, meaning, I'm living with pain, shame, and guilt. Where is their meaning? And there are tears running down his face. He starts to tell his story of trying to take his life a couple of times. I don't know who he was. And all I said to him was, you know, you look like a man made for the movies. I didn't know he was a movie actor. I said, you're talking about pain, shame, and guilt. I said, what you're talking about is so deeply personal. See me after the meeting. I'll talk with you one-on-one. So he came to the back, but of course, because of who he was, the people hovering over, listening to the conversation. And as I saw what was happening in his heart, I thought to myself, you know, I don't want to be speaking. I didn't want to speak. I was like a Jonah. I didn't want to answer questions. I just wanted a break. God brings people into your life at a time you need that person the most and reshapes and rechanges everything for you. I will guide you with my eye, he said. We embraced each other as he as we prayed, I knew God was going to use this man enormously. I let him tell you his story, except after he told me the sordid reality of what he'd come through. I said, you know, Hayden, I'm not familiar with this kind of stuff, but I know a guy who is. His name is Sanj Kalra. I said, I'm going to be, because he, Hayden said, I want to travel with you for several months. I'll pay my way. I said, I'm going to be in, the, in Singapore in a few days. I'll fly my friend in. You both talk. I believe he can help you far more than I can because he will understand where you're coming from. And I kept praying. I don't know if these two boys were going to get along or what. So I flew Sanjin. The rest is God's doing. And the same with my colleague, Matt, who's a prince of a guy. I've got three of my, two of my former travel associates who are still on our staff and my present one, Thomas. Crin, followed by Matt, and then Matt got to know Hayden. These guys have been like a light in his world. Bright, shining lights. And no matter where you go in the Philippines, he's a head turner. They know who he is. And now they know what he believes and who he really is as a child of the living God. And I just consider it an awesome privilege to call him my friend. It was God who arranged that meeting. We had never planned it. Our ZIM today was planned by him too. In these 11 countries, touching the globe, having an impact through the literature, through all that's going on, lives are changing. And I believe we have only just begun. And I thank God for your pastor's trust and faith to come alongside us. We need it because the doors are wide and the opportunities are, opportunities are plentiful. We need men and women like you to come alongside and say, we'll hold you up. You keep running the distance. We're there behind you to help you take the headwinds and reach this generation for Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. He is the answer. And we are taking that answer to clear the bushes of their questions so they can take a direct look at the cross of Jesus Christ and understand the gospel. Thank you so much for giving me a hearing. It's good to have him, isn't it? This is really good. All right, um, I want to tell you, you know, he mentioned Hayden. One of the reasons that I wanted, uh, that this is going to be such a special night is that I wanted Robbie to give you an idea of the scope of uh, the ministry. And then I wanted to show you an example, an example that touched our church. 16 months ago, uh, I got a, 
uh, a, a call from Tom Randall, our own Tom Randall. And he was being arrested right then. Uh, and it was violent and it was bad. And uh, he got taken into Manila and then uh, put in a jail at the NBI headquarters. And uh, I had been talking with Sanj. Uh, Sanj Calra is a member of our church, somebody who came to Christ here and then got connected with Ravi in a weird kind of way. And so, so I texted Sanj and I said, you told me a story about a guy, Hayden. Uh, can you have him go see Tom? And uh, Sanj texted me back and said, I'm on it. And then an hour later, he texted me and said, Hayden's on his way. And so Hayden was the guy who was our hands and feet ministering to Tom uh, during one of the darkest times in Tom's life, one of the hardest times in, uh, in our church's life. And so it is a, a great, great privilege to have uh, Hayden come, and I want him to tell his story, and then uh, the three of us will get up here and tell you what happened there in the Philippines. So Hayden, please come. Thanks. Hayden, uh, so you know, uh, Hayden is uh, Filipino, which means that his primary language is Tagalog, yeah. so he'll be speaking English, which uh, will be his secondary language. The other thing is that Hayden is a, uh, I think I get this right, plastic surgeon turned supermodel turned actor turned follower of Christ, and out of all those, follower of Christ is the best. Yeah. Uh, excellent. That, uh, Thanks. Welcome, Hayden. Well. Thank you so much. I have to be very honest with you. I'm a, I really dread public speaking. Dr. Ravi knows this. Sanj knows this. I'm, a, I'm just about ready to pee on my pants. <laughs> <laughs> so you kind of have to uh, translate some words for me. Magandang gabi sa inyong lahat. Good evening, everybody. He <laughs> says good evening. Okay. Um, he also said that I'm very handsome. <laughs> 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 well, Sanj, Sanj and his family were just, uh, they were, they were just in the Philippines uh, few, last week. They were basking in the sun, enjoying the sun there. And uh, I was just kind of hiding from the, from the sun in the shade because uh, as a cosmetic surgeon, I understood that uh, the sun really damages skin and makes you age faster and stuff like that. So I'm really enjoying your cool weather here right now. <laughs> it's funny how we always want what we don't have enough. Well, anyway. Well, the reason why I'm here and I dare stand in front of you today is because I simply love Jesus. And I want to tell you the story of how God changed my life for the better. And I also want to tell you a story about how RZIM was instrumental to that change and um, how, um, how our mighty God, our grand weaver, orchestrated everything decades before so that I could also play a role in the story of your beloved pastor, Tom Randall. So um, <clears throat> I guess the best way to start is by telling you who I was before I met Christ. <clears throat> I, was about, um, I was about eight or nine or 10 years old when, when something happened to me in the past that, uh, that completely separated the boy I was from the man I really wanted to be. It's something that uh, parents here wouldn't want your children to go through. I was... Um, I was molested by a man several times when I was a kid. Um, I don't exactly know how I was able to cope uh, with, with that emotion and physical abuse, but I do remember thinking to myself that, that some, I lost something that was really essential to my being human. And I made two conclusions from that experience. One was that there's no more point trying to live a good and righteous life because I'm, I'm scarred and it's irreversible. The second conclusion I made was that I will never tell anyone about what happened to me, the disgusting thing that happened to me, and as long as nobody knows, I'll be fine. I learned that people cannot be trusted, so I cannot tell anyone. But the problem was I also learned, or started to think, that I could actually do anything even if I know it's bad or evil, but as long as nobody knows, I'll be okay. And that was gonna have a catastrophic effect in my life later on. 
So that molestation experience became the major thing that defined who I was and it controlled, kind of controlled everything that I thought, the way I felt, and the way I acted. So from that, from that experience, I, as I matured, I began to think this, this, there's no God, it's impossible. And if there's a God, it's impossible that he is a loving God, there's no way. Because he allowed this to happen to me. I thought, in, I was sent to a Christian school and we were taught that God is a loving God, but I, I couldn't believe it. He allowed this to happen to me and I can't love someone I cannot trust. And so, so I felt that uh, if he didn't care about me, then why would I care about him? And I thought also that uh, life would be much happier, much enjoyable, more enjoyable if there was no God to tell me what I could or could not do. But the problem was I still wanted to look good and I wanted to look like a very good Christian gentleman. So when I was in high school, I actually used to lead prison worship in the morning devotion fellowship. I would do that every day. But I, the problem was I didn't really believe in God anymore. I just enjoyed the company of the people there. They were good Christians. <clears throat> so I was very polite, always gentle, always respectful. I made sure that I did my homework all the time so I could be an honor student. I, uh, when I got to college, I played in the basketball varsity team and uh, I became a ramp model. I was doing uh, international modeling in, in Singapore and Korea and Japan. And in 2005, I, I was finally able to, to uh, follow the footsteps of my dad, who was a doctor. I got my medical degree. And then um, I became the president of the interns association in one of the most prestigious hospitals in the Philippines. But uh, after that, I was, uh, I was about 2006, five, 2005. So I pursued my, my training in anti-aging medicine. Uh, in Paris, because I wanted to be the number, the first in the Philippines. There were, at that time, there were no anti-aging specialists in the Philippines. But I got before I could take the boards, I got sidetracked um, to uh, with a faster way to fame and, for, uh, and fortune, and that was show business, the entertainment industry. So it's getting offers to be to be an actor, and so finally I thought, hmm, this is uh, easier. I'd be more famous, uh, easier money, so I, I accepted, and I became a TV star. And uh, at that time, I was only 25, and life was very good. Money was very easy, I was getting more popular, I, I was really enjoying my life, but the problem was, every time I'm alone, I still felt this emptiness inside me. There's still something wrong. And so what I did was I filled my life with more frenetic activity. I did a lot of things, awful things. I was driving a Porsche, I was living in a Porsche condo, I was uh, dating and sleeping with models and celebrities, but uh, still something was wrong until I got into drugs, uh, drug ecstasy, and that's the drug, the drug that really got me because it really lives up to its name. I had a lot of issues. Um, and so, by taking ecstasy, I thought, oh, for, for $20 a day, I could be more self-confident, you know. So I borrowed an identity from drugs, and I would take drugs every morning and evening for many years. For many years. <laughs> but there are other stuff that I, I did that uh, was really disgusting, too. And one of those was uh, I started also... Uh, videotaping um, some of my sexual escapades. <clears throat> so that was me before I met Christ. I was uh, self-centered, I was very hedonistic, but I was also broken and I was really lonely. And so in December 2008, after my best friend's girlfriend confessed to my best friend that we were having an affair, my best friends conspired to destroy me and cut my legs from under me. So what they did was, uh, while one person invited me to a dinner, the other two went to my, my apartment and got everything they could get. Um, computers, laptops, cameras, memory cards, whatever they could get to find some evidence so that they could release this to the public and show also my girlfriend. They just really wanted to destroy me and teach me a lesson. 
they, they didn't know what they were going to find, but I knew. And I also knew that if this ever comes out, that's going to be the end of me. So I was so completely terrified. So what I did was uh, I went to, I write my own um, prescription. I went to the drugstore. I bought uh, 30 pieces of that sedative volumes. And I downed everything. Sent out my, my, uh, my goodbye messages, and then, and then I waited for me to die. But, but instead, I woke up three days from a coma, and uh, I descended into the psychiatric ward, and seated beside me was my father. <laughs> and I found myself trapped in the psychiatric ward, um, in the same hospital where I was just two years before the president of the intern, so everyone there knew me. So it made the whole ordeal more humiliating. <clears throat> but as, uh, so after several weeks of detoxification, I was finally allowed to go home. That was Christmas time in uh, 2009. So they allowed me to spend Christmas with my family. And every day at that time was, a, was really a struggle because my body was really still looking for the drugs. So I fought really hard until in May 2009, someone, a stranger, called me asking for $100,000 for me to pay, otherwise they will release the videos. So for me, of course, there was no way to, to find out if there, was, there were no other copies, so, so I didn't acquiesce to their demands. So on my own birthday, May 20, 2009, they released the videos. Every week they would release one video. So the, vid the videos immediately went viral. Of course, as expected, and everyone was really feasting on it. It started appearing online and then in street DVDs. It became the banner headline in all the major newspapers. CNN ranked it the number one Asia scandal, celebrity scandal in Asia. Uh, this morning I was just looking at it. I was trying to recall the feelings that I had. I was looking at all the, uh, the headlines, that, uh, all the things that they said about me. I was the most hated man in the Philippines at that time. Um, I was banned from going to several provinces. And also at that time, <clears throat> it was a year before the Senate election. So some senators decided, oh, maybe we can use Hayden Koss case as their sort of the cornerstone of their campaign banner. So they unjustly, illegally brought me to the Senate where they, they publicly humiliated and shamed me. I was in the Senate, there were only two senators there, there was supposed to be more, there was supposed to be a quorum. And before the hearing started, somebody poured water on my head, and it's all televised, it's all public. Now, at that time I was just really, I was really total slender, I didn't, I didn't want to fight anymore. But everyone was piggybacking on the issue. The Board of Medicine, because of my immorality, decided to revoke my, my medical license. And uh, I, guess in, I guess in one fell swoop, everything that was important to me, my fame, fortune, my career, my future, it was all gone. But uh, I guess the hardest, the most painful stuff there was uh, when my own friends, all of my so-called friends, maybe except three or four, decided to abandon me. Uh, it's true what they say, you know, um, that uh, it's not the silence of my friends that hurt me the most. I, it is not the words of my enemy that hurts me the most, but the silence of my friends. I, was, I would always go with that. It was so painful at that time, because I had nobody, nobody. So I was feeling hopeless, and I, I was still left with nothing, so I decided it's better to just opt out of life again. So what I did this time was uh, I called my, my, my drug supplier. I got 20 pieces of that drug ecstasy, and I drank everything. Boy, that... That ecstasy really threw me into convulsions, violent convulsions, uncontrollable convulsions. That when the police found me, I was all bloodied and wounded with my body rising a foot above the gurney. But as luck, or maybe as God would have it, they brought me to a hospital in the province where unfortunately someone was taping a movie. So again, my humiliating suicide was caught on camera and viewed by the, the whole country. This was 2010. So my failed uh, second attempt at suicide started to make me think that perhaps, 
Perhaps there was a reason for me being here. Perhaps there was somebody or something or someone out there who had his protective hand over my, over my life. So I began searching for answers. I started devouring um, self-help books and spirituality books. I regularly consulted with psychologists and psychiatrists and psychics and tarot readers and fortune tellers. I, uh, when that didn't work, I admitted myself into drug rehab and stayed there for four months. And uh, they were just squeezing money out of me. So <laughs> they were just milking me. So uh, I decided to, to go to, this, to Sedona to stay there for one month in a, on a retreat where I met a Korean, ver someone who claims to be a Korean reincarnation of Jesus. And uh, I thought, hmm, this is, this is not working. So for four years, I was really... I was really trying to change. I really wanted to be a good man. I was really trying everything, but just, nothing just, nothing was working. I still had those thoughts. I still had the same compulsions. I still had the same addictions. I kept on making mistakes and sabotaging whatever progress I was making. And so on May 23, uh, May, yeah, May 23, 2013, I was ready to take ecstasy again. But on the same day that I had gotten my, my drugs from a friendly pusher, a business, part of, business partner friend of mine called me and invited me to a talk with Dr. Ravi Zacharias. And I thought, that same day, I, I literally had drugs here and I, I had made an, an unholy appointment with someone that night. So I thought, oh, well, I had read the, the name Ravi Zacharias rang a bell because I had read this book before, Has Christianity Failed You? Which I read because that's how I felt about Christianity. So, off I went, I went there early so I could also leave early. At the same time, uh, Dr. Rev Ravi told you about this already. He had just given two talks that night, uh, that day, and he thought it was gonna be a birthday dinner, and uh, he didn't know that he was slated to talk, so that was really a surprise. Thanks for that gift. <laughs> <laughs> and so Dr. Ravi spoke about, about how Jesus gives meaning and purpose and hope in, in life. and. Uh, and about how it is very important for us to live in the truth. And um, after, after his talk, I was, I, I didn't belong there. Those were all Christian businessmen. And actually when I, when I got there, it was very palpable. Everyone was sort of kind of asking each other why I was there, who invited me. And so when he finished talking, I raised my hand to ask more questions. And I said, Dr. Ravi, you speak about truth, you speak about meaning as if it's so easy to, 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 to get to. But we've been here for many, many generations, we still don't know the truth. And we am living in pain and shame. My, my life is like this. So my question became a confession, a public confession in front of everyone. I was really crying already. And I think Dr. Ravi felt my, my, uh, my, my pain there. And uh, yeah, you told me, Dr. Ravi, that that at that time I didn't understand what this meant, but he said that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And it didn't make sense to me. I know, okay, I heard about Jesus before, and you know, it's nice to hear these words, but I don't, don't really get this. But I think, <clears throat> yeah, Dr. Ravi sen sensing my pain and desperation kind of took me under my wing, talk, uh, under his wing, he talked to me and told me, you know, we can, we can spend more time with each other. So, um, that encounter with Dr. Ravi was really the start of my, my finding Christ. He would let me know where he would be, and, and like, a, like a starving man, I would, I would fly and go like a, someone who's very hungry for spiritual food. That's where I met uh, Sanj Kalra in Singapore, who just flew in just to talk to me for two days. And uh, Sanj told me about his story, and we had a lot of things in common. And, and, and that, that, that uh, encounter with, with, with Sanj, I realized that I'm, I'm not alone in this world. I'm not the only one who had uh, some secrets that we don't want others to know. Uh, things that we're really very ashamed of that if people find out, then. So Sanj shared, me, shared with me how God changed his life and how he restored, God restored his life. And I told Sanj, this is also what I want. This is also what I want, also what I needed. So after talking with Sanj and Dr. Ravi, it was in Singapore, finally, I said, 
okay, I'm going to give my life to Christ as my Savior. I'm going to make Jesus, Jesus my Savior. I'm going to do my best to follow him as my Lord. At that time, I felt deep within me that something, has, something happened. I can't explain what it was, but uh, it's something that is beyond understanding. But I, I did feel something. It was before, just to wake up in the morning took a lot of courage. After that, I felt like there was someone, I had an ally who can actually help me. So that, after that, I began to really enjoy reading the Bible. I, I started attending Sunday worship. Um, wherever Dr. Rabbi was, I would go. I also became particularly interested in apologetics and thanks to RCIM um, because of I, I needed, I had a lot of questions. I had a lot of questions and, and if I couldn't answer them, it's, it was hard, so hard for me to believe. And so I think after that, God was really ready to, re- to reveal himself to me and reveal his power to me. So last, January last year, January last year, this is, I guess, one of uh, the best stories of my life. Um, Sanj, I received a call from Sanj. Um, he told me that uh, a certain Tom Randall was, uh, was um, arrested for some false mistake in accusations. And I don't, of course, I didn't know who Tam, Tom Randall was, except that he once played in, in the PBA, in the Philippine Basketball Association in the Philippines. So... I, I didn't ask any more questions. All I know is that Sanj, Sanj is a friend. I went there, I saw Tom. Tom thought that I was, like, I also got arrested and he was a poor thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I approached Tom and I told Tom I was sent by CCC. He goes, how are you connected with the church? I don't even know what it stands for. <laughs> <laughs> Sanj, Sanj, Sanj asked me to, to, to see him. So, so that happened. Um, we talked. Tom shared with me his story, and we prayed, af- we, we prayed together after that. And um, so after that, I, he, he was moved to another detention center, so I, I, visited, I regularly visited Tom there. And I didn't need any passes or permits. I, visited whenever I want because uh, those guys knew me. Because those NBI detectives, those agents, were the same agents who investigated me before. So they know me. <laughs> we, uh, we have a, well, not a nice relationship, but we, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we knew each other. So I was able to go there. And my experience in the drug rehab where I went to before uh, taught me, well, gave me an idea about how the, the detention center is, is being run because our, our drug rehab was being run like prison. So I, I knew that if I want to, if I have to bring food to, if, if I want to bring food to Tom, I have to bring for everyone, <laughs> for all the officers and everyone else. So I bought like lots of food. Every other day I would visit, I would visit Tom. But here's the thing. The first time I visited Tom, I had so many, I had lots of food. Yeah. This guy, <laughs> ask for something else. The first time I visited Tom, we talked, we shared, this guy asked for something else. He asked for Bibles. He asked for Bibles. And I know that Tom knew at that time that God placed him there for a reason. So, in the detention center, Tom ministered, or shared the gospel to criminals. He shared the gospel to terrorists, to rapists, frauds. Before Tom left the detention center, criminals were saved, and God broke through. And Tom is going to share some stories later. <laughs> Stay right here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Joe, so get us a chair. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, here's what it says. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. 
so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak without fear. I, I think one thing, the greatest thing I learned this last year after going to prison and while I was in prison or in jail um, was that no matter how unfavorable my circumstances became, I could still stand uh, for the Lord in my faith and love him completely. And to me, now that I look back, that is a precious gift, to be able to love the Lord completely no matter what your circumstances are. And when you hear a story of Dr. Hayden Cole, he learned to love the Lord despite the circumstances that had come into his life and changed his life and transformed it. You can imagine when he came into the, uh, it was like an office when I first met yeah, you. Yeah. They were holding me and trying to decide if they were going to charge me because they, they were trying to figure out to have a case against you me. You were sleeping on the floor. I was sleeping on the, on the tile linoleum. linoleum floor and I was very sick. Um, but when he walked in the room, everybody got excited. You know, there was offices around and people and secretaries. And uh, they all kept looking. This guy came in, and I didn't know you, Hayden. I apologize. I should I have known know you. you. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, we didn't know each other. And, and yeah, I was impressed that you didn't know me either. Yeah. <laughs> and so I looked at this poor guy, and he, everybody wanted his autograph. Everybody. And I'm thinking, oh, this poor guy's going to jail, and they're asking for his autograph. <laughs> Wait a minute. Do I need to change mics with him? Yeah. Okay. Let me change packs. Why didn't you have mine? Here, let me. I'll get yours. Here's your pack. <laughs> <laughs> I got, we need to work at at this church, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody better else do this, because this is not Joe's specialty. I know that. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Yes, yes, Can I talk again? Yeah. Sorry, everybody. Thanks for being so patient. <laughs> I put it in there. Where was I? Oh, I was uh, on the floor speaking. Well, you saw me. Yeah, and you I saw, saw me, you. Yeah. And I said, Guapo un lalaki telega. Here's this handsome guy walks in here, and all the women were just swooning. And even Roy, who's the meanest, Curliest, this is not taped, is it? Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Actually, he wasn't that bad. <laughs> the, one who, the one who handcuffed me and kind of, he worked me over a bit to get me down there where they wanted me. And, and I looked at him, and even he was wanted an autograph from Hayden Coe. And so I thought, wow. And then they said, oh, no, he's not, he's not in here for jail. He's visiting, signing autographs. And then he looked at me, and he said, are you Tom Randall? I said, Yes. He said, I'm Hayden Cole, and uh, I cannot rem remember the words exactly, but he said, um, I'm here to help you, and the church sent me or something. She I can't remember. It. Yeah, but what I do remember is, who, who do you, how do you know me? And he said, Sanj sent me. <laughs> and when he said that, I just leaped into his arms. I just said, <laughs> that's all I knew was I, was, I was going to pit of hell, but at least Sanj knew where I was, you know? <laughs> And then I found out later that Joe had called Sanj with this whole idea. I've, I've learned over the last 14, 15 months, whatever it's been, that Joe Coffey has done more things to help me than I can keep track of. Mm -hmm. I find something out every week that he's done. Mm -hmm. So, Joe, thank you. Yeah. There are, friends, there are friends who pretend to be friends, and there are friends who stick closer than a brother. Proverbs 18:24. Sands, you stick closer than a brother. Doc, you stick closer than a brother. And Joe, you stick closer than a brother. It's not ironic that the one who sent me to prison or had a lot to do with it was somebody I considered a very, very close friend for 33 years and was actually sitting in the car when I got handcuffed and taken away and did nothing about it. I've learned the difference between those relationships that you're talking about. You know, a relationship with God gives you the potential to love people and not pretend, but to sincerely love them. And those are the relationship God loves. And I can feel you, Joe, behind me. I know you want to say something. <laughs> what you, am I, is this working now? Are we, 
Is it me? We'll have a training seminar next week on all of this when you guys. <laughs> oh, am I not on? You're on. You can hear it. I think my pack's on. Oh, my pack's not on. <laughs> Sorry, Jason, that wasn't you. All right. I want you to know Hayden became a Christian in September. And so he was brand new. And I remember when Sanj came home. Uh, well, I was saying, why are you going to Singapore? And he's going, there's this guy. He's like the Tom Cruise of the Philippines. That's what he said. I'm much taller. <laughs> he said he's much, taller. much, That's much true. taller. That's yeah. true. So, uh, <laughs> Sorry, so then uh, when Tom got arrested, the only thing I could think of was that I got to get somebody in Manila to go see him. And so I texted Sanj, and I said, can you somehow get Hayden over to see Tom? And I told him where he was. He was in the MBI headquarters and, if, and I knew, too, that I mean, if they had met in Singapore, that the chances of Hayden actually being in Manila might be slim. But uh, God had Hayden, right? And you know, I mean, I've, I've told you all, we, you know, we were texting by, you know, it was a, an amazing thing that Tom had, was able to have his phone, but we texted a thousand texts over that 22 days. But every time that Hayden would come, uh, Tom would text me and just say, Hayden came today. And he brought food, he brought Bibles. He, he would sign the Bibles because if he, a signed Hayden Bible was like, I want one, you know? So, um, anyway. Um, one of the things Joe's making clear that we should look at how God does this because he never does it in a way that we would ever do it. Because when Hayden showed up, I started to find out about him. So Norman Black was the most famous coach in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. He also shows up when Hayden's there. And he wants to see me, and he's, his pocket's bulging like this. It's just bulging. And he says, Tom, guess what I have in my pocket? I said, I don't know. I hope it's not illegal because we're already in trouble here. <laughs> and he said, no, Tom, I have $55,000 in my pocket. That's all I could get right now. I said, what for? He said, for your bond so we can get you out of jail, whatever they ask, the bond. You know, God was sending me him and Norm Black and money and People in the States, Joe and people here are saying, get the best lawyers, we'll pay for it. I felt so taken care of, you know. But only God can reach those places. And one of the things that Hayden didn't know that I felt, that I wanted to pray with him. And he prayed with me. And one of the reasons I wanted to pray with him, because I wanted to find out if he was sincere. Because don't you think it's odd that God would send a man who just went through all these sexual problems and it's known everywhere to a guy who's just been accused of sex trafficking? Do you know what I mean? So some of the guys are saying, Tom, you probably shouldn't be hanging out with Hayden right now. <laughs> true, right, Hayden? True, true, I mean, true. And yet when I prayed with him, and I, and I know Sanj, and I trust Sanj completely, and Joe, when I heard his heart in his prayer, I didn't care what anybody thought. I was there for representing the Lord. Again, it's our privilege. Not where God places us, but how we deal with where God places us. Doc, he will lead us where we're going to go, won't he? Yeah, I listened to your story, and I think that's what he did for us. And thanks so much. I got something for you. Can I give him? Because see, the Filipinos, we have so many wonderful traditions. And one of them is gratefulness. That's why when Filipinos come... one of our traditions, Malut. You guys know Balut, Balut? the one-day-old embryo egg? <laughs> you, don't know embryo. you didn't bring any, did you? <laughs> okay. We might get arrested in this country for that. <laughs> Balut is a, 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 one, a duck egg. Just before it's going to be born, they cook it. And then they open it and you eat it. Isn't that gross? <laughs> and I happen to like them. That's how far I've gone. But in the Philippines, we have traditions, and the tradition is... Um, when you open your heart to a Filipino, they open their heart to yours. And it's the same as Christians. He opened his heart to me to help me. I wasn't about to reject that. Uh, everyone else that was interrogating in there was trying tricks on me to fool me. Here's a guy that was sincere. I didn't care what his reputation was. I knew what his spirit and his heart was. I've learned since last year, reputations aren't as valuable as you think they are. Yeah. How you walk with God is, though. And so in the Philippines, we give what we call, we have what we call utang nala ub which um, is when you're indebted to another person because they've done something for you, and you will try your very best to pay back that utang nalaub. And when you do, it creates a bond of friendship, and 
and somebody does something to you and then you do something back for them and it continues. And the whole country is almost, the fibers of the country hold together on Utang Nala'ub, don't they? And so I have Utang Nala'ub to Dr. Hayden. He doesn't think so, but I do. Because he showed up every time they were visiting hours. Sometimes when they were not visiting hours, he'd show up. And the guards would say, Tom, Hayden Cole is here. I said, I thought no visiting hours. They said, not for Hayden Cole. <laughs> and he would come in and feed me and then feed everybody, pray with me. Then he brought Vicky Bello, who happened to be the most famous female surgeon in the whole country. Now the more autographs. And as you bring all these people that are famous, you just get more favor with the guards and the inmates and everybody else because they think, well, you know these people will be nice to you. So my apostle Lubung for you, Padre, I, I brought you a couple, okay? If you can open that. In America, we open it in front of everybody. Okay. <laughs> it's soft. <laughs> That's my utang nala lube to you. It's, it's unique to Cleveland and our culture here. Yeah. And you love basketball. Wrong Turn it around. Turn it around. <laughs> and thank you, thank you. and uh, because you're a, a model and everything, and you're so cool, that you have to have the coolest shoes that are out right now. And these are the coolest shoes. What size are your feet? I'm, uh, fashion 101. <laughs> yes. What size are your 12? feet? Twelve. <laughs> Twelve. I guessed correctly. Thank you. You, don't have, you, uh, you have to give me $20 for this. It's a, uh, they say. Okay. <laughs> and this Just is kidding. for you also. But oh, don't open that you. now because you'll be embarrassed yeah. in front of everybody. <laughs> Should we wear this now? Right. When, they, okay. when Hayden came, he would ask me how I'm doing. And some days I was really sick. And then we prayed that they would let me go to the hospital. And they wouldn't, of course. And then... Um, my godson showed up from across the street. He saw it on television that I was arrested. Just so happens that we put him through school for 28 years and he became a surgeon. And God put him right across the street so he could beside, run across. Beside the uh, detention center. Yeah. yeah. Coincidence. I know. Yeah. He ran across the street and, of course, he brought the hospital to me. God brought the hospital to the And then as I got better, I got stronger. I was able to talk all day. I had the energy to talk all day to everybody about Jesus and... and uh, and 11 inmates came to Christ, and two guards came to Christ, and my lawyer came to Christ. When you lead a lawyer to Christ, you're working hard, you know? <laughs> Almost done, sir. And but I want to share something also. Um, last year, as a, I really wanted to know more about apologetics. I went to Oxford, uh, the OCC, RGIMs, uh, Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics. And while I was there, just studying the word and pursuing, you know, trying to know who God is really, um, I received news from the Philippines that the Board of Medicine had decided to give back my medical license. So I didn't have to do anything. And the two senators who dragged me to the Senate and the guy who released the videos, they all went to jail. And I really didn't have to do anything. It was, they, they did something else. Uh, they all went to jail. So it's pretty amazing. And we also, I have a friend here. His na her name is Denise. She was a, we, we went to a, to a retreat there, and then she shared with me how she's uh, uh, really getting sad because she has to move here and leave her, 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 her daughter in the Philippines. And she told me that she's moving to Ohio. Really? Where? Akron. <laughs> I have to connect you to Sanj. And now Denise goes to Sanj's Bible study yeah. group, right? <laughs> so it's kind of, you and know, I how God orchestrates that, everything. To finish, I think what we both have learned, mm. because of, uh, we know betrayal, mm. don't we? And we talked about that so often. But what we learned is uh, through these things, you can learn to love God more than ever. Yeah. And when you do, Ephesians 3.20 says... <laughs> Before that, I wanted to say also, it was before, to me, it was really impossible to, to love someone I couldn't trust. And, and this is what really blows my mind. God knows that I am not trustworthy. I know that I'm not trustworthy, but then he continues to love me. And, and 1 John 4, 10, I just want to read this to you. This is how he showed his love for us, that God sent his only son into the world so we might live through him. And this is the kind of love that we are talking about. Not that we once upon a time loved him, but that he loved us and sent his son to die on the cross so we could have 
to, we could have we could restore our relationship with God. So Maraming salamat ta. May utang na loob sa iyo pare. No, no. I have a big utang to him and to Joe no, and to all of you and thank God the grace of God covers that for me. All right, what I um, what I want to do right now is just close it out, but I want to have the chain come up because one of the things that you you never know when you impact somebody else where God's going to take it. And God has connected all of us uh, through Robbie. So I need Robbie to come up, Sanj to come up. Come on up. And I'm sorry, you're, Denise. You're, Denise. Where's Denise? Denise here. She's there. She's there. Alika. Let me move this back. Here you go. All right, so uh, this is the way the chain went. Is uh, Tom and I became friends years and years ago, and then uh, finally convinced him that he should be living in Ohio. So he comes to to our church, and within, huh, what, a couple months, yeah, you, were, you became trouble like that. So he comes to Ohio, but while he's coming, you know, actually he's coming in September, right in September is when Hay- or Hayden's coming to Christ, Sange came to Christ, how long ago? Five. Five years ago, here and when Hayden came to Christ, uh, this is, uh, I got to t- or when uh, Sanj came to Christ, I got to tell you this, because God uses different things in different people's lives. One of the things that's, that was true with Sanj is he was kind of a star chaser as uh, when, just his whole life. So if you go over to his house, he has pictures of him and Charles Barkley and him and you know, Will Chamberlain and him and, you know, all, I mean, uh, Stevie, Stevie Tyler, right? Everybody. everybody. He's got everybody. So, right, so when he became a Christian, he came to me and he said, uh, I just read a book by a guy named Robbie Zacharias. I got to meet him. I was going, well, good luck, right? <laughs> and he goes, no, no, I got to meet him. He's, he's Indian like me, and he, he, you know, he, I just read this book from east to west, and it's, it's awesome. I got to meet him, got to meet him. And I was going, all right, well, uh, so I try to call people who might uh, be connected enough with Robbie to, to try to make some kind of introduction or every, anything. So anyway, Sanj goes, drives to Toronto to meet uh, to watch Robbie speak, and Robbie had gotten enough calls that he said, okay, I'll, I'll talk to him, and I'll greet him beforehand. That's when Sanj brought his mom and dad to Toronto to hear Robbie. Robbie spent time with him and said, hold on, afterwards took him in a room. Am I getting the story right? right? So, yeah. Took him in a back room, and then uh, Robbie ended up leading Sanj's mom to Christ, and then took a liking to Sanj, and then took Sanj under his wing and started uh, learning more about Sanj's story, and then had Sanj start to, uh, to go and give his testimony, which, uh, by the way, next week, Sanj is giving his testimony here uh, for us, but uh, started giving his testimony around. And so Sanj is, is being discipled, basically, by Ravi Zacharias, which is just incredible, because my whole life I was trying to get to meet Ravi, and, you know, <laughs> and then Sanj is like, Oh, yeah, he's like my buddy. We're going everywhere. <laughs> right. But then Sanj gets flown to Singapore to meet Hayden in uh, September. And September, Tom's coming here. Then my best friend Tom gets arrested in the Philippines. And God is working way ahead all the time, moving the pieces around so there would be somebody there who could remind Tom that he wasn't forgotten that it was love, that would bring him food, that would bring him Bibles. And now there are uh, a bunch of inmates who have come to Christ, who their chain is going out, and they're sometime going to tell a story with a bunch of people behind them and say, yeah, when I was in prison in the Philippines, this guy, Tom Randall, Hayden Co., came and led me to Christ, and that's why you came to Christ, and that's why you've come, and that's why you've come. All right? So, anyway, I just wanted you to see the whole chain here. And uh, thank you.
this is one tiny, tiny chain uh, that uh, Ravi Zacharias has spent his lifetime creating chains like this all around the world. Uh, and if we could gather them all together, um, who knows how many people would fill a stadium or a city. So that's why we're so grateful to have Ravi here with us this weekend. And I'm going to have Ravi close in prayer, and then we're done for the evening. Ravi, would you close us? Thank you. Well, this has been quite an evening, isn't it? Quite amazing, really. Uh, and I wrote a book called The Grand Weaver. When I saw saris being made in India, I always thought it was a very complex process, and it is. It only takes two people, a father who sits on the platform and a son who sits two steps below. The father has all the spools of thread around him. The son has just the shuttle to move from right to left and left to right. So the father pulls the strings together and nods, and the son moves the shuttle right to left, left to right. You come back three, four days later, and you see a beautiful sari being woven, a design which was always in the mind of the father, is unfolding. The son did the easy part, just responded to the nod of the father, and that beautiful garment was woven. I said to my wife when I saw that, I can do what the son does. I can't do what the father does. He has to hold the threads, and he brings them all together. If we would only learn this simple truth, he holds the threads in your life. If you will just respond to his nod, to his leading, and to his stops, at the end of the day when you stand before him, you will know the design was all of his, and you had very little to do with it except to respond to his leading and his prompting. He is the grand weaver. He is the grand designer. When you're young, you think it's all about you. When you get older, you realize it was he who brought it all together. And this is just a beautiful design and a marvelous design we've seen unfold. I remember Assange phoning me about the Tom story and what Hayden was doing, and I said, this is absolutely incredible how this has all come together. Let's bow our heads and receive the blessing of the Lord. Lord, I thank you for this church. This church itself is the work of your weaving design. There are so many different threads here. You have brought Joe here with a vision that is both proximate and distant. The passion that is to serve you wherever your name is exalted. Lord, I cannot honestly recall when I have been part of a group of people in a church like this whose goal is to help stand with us doing this calling that you have placed. I am overwhelmed. We are overwhelmed. I thank you for Pastor Joe's leadership and all those who have worked so hard behind the scenes for this weekend for many, many months. Thank you for many of my colleagues out here who also work behind the scenes and do it with a deep, deep love for you. I pray this will be a weekend that we will never forget, that we will meet you in a way that is so beautiful, so pristine, and so lasting, that even the most resistant and the one who seems to find you afar off will leave this place by the time the weekend is over, saying you are upholding them, carrying them, taking them by the hand, putting your arm around them, and lifting them through the barricades and the hurdles. Bless this church. I'm so grateful for its witness. Let your benediction rest upon us. Tonight I pray especially for Hayden. His is a tough life ahead with all the seductions and allurements. And yet, Lord, how well I remember his words last year when he said, I'm not yet what I want to be, but I'm not what I used to be. Take him like a little child 
till he can run and not be weary and walk and not be faint and that his life will mount up with wings as eagles. Thank you for the story of Tom, of Sanj. Amazing. You are an amazing God. We bow our heads before you in awe and total surrender. How glorious is your habitation. And we have only got a tiny glimpse through a keyhole. One day, Lord, face to face. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Thanks so much for coming. God bless.